The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. I hope you are all having a good day. Uh, this is Dawn Miller. I'm with the Health Care Authority, the Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery. Uh, and today we have Jonathan Beard, who's going to present information about first episode, episode <laughs> psychosis teams and provision of supported education services. I was just joking with him. I needed one more cup of coffee, he said, or a deep breath. So I'll try both. Uh, <laughs> this is being recorded and the recording will be sent out at a later date along with the slides. Um, I'm assuming we're going to have an, uh, quite a number more attendees join as we go, but we're going to go ahead and get started for the benefit of those that have been here and waiting. So good morning and welcome. Jonathan, over to you. Okay, thanks so much and uh, good morning everyone. It's really a delight to uh, to be with you and uh, hopefully we'll share some information with you that you'll find um, valuable. Um, I've worked pretty closely with uh, Lisa Bennett Perry uh, in providing consultation and training to our first episode psychosis teams around the state and because of that partnership and I think there was a need for a pinch hitter today, Lisa reached out and said, you know, could you do just a brief, you know, um, discussion around what first episode psychosis teams are and what they're doing, and then substance of what we'll cover today uh, will be supported education services. So I'm really happy to be in a position to be able to share that with you. Uh, my experience around the state working both with first episode psychosis teams and also assertive community treatment teams in the state is I think by and large, we're doing a pretty good job um, on the supported employment side, you know, following the ISP or the IPS model. Um, but the supported ed piece seems to be lagging behind. So I'm, I'm hoping again, this will be timely and um, you know, hopefully arm you with some knowledge and skills uh, so that we can advance you know, people's education um, as a piece of our way of working with them uh, in a supported employment uh, capacity. So without further ado, why don't we um, get started with a little 101 on first episode psychosis teams. Because I'm a rookie with this, um, Go to webinar um, way of delivering online. Um, when I was talking with Don, we decided it may be best to do chat for questions. So I can look at that in the toolbar as we move along. And then we'll also have some time uh, at the end for additional questions. But I just thought, in terms of not knowing the technology really well, being able to like click on and click off people to mute them and unmute them might be asking a bit much for me given my rookie status. So I beg your indulgence on that, but we'll certainly try to get to people uh, via the chat as much as we can. So here we go. What we're gonna try to cover today in the next 90 minutes, as you can see on this next slide, uh, we'll spend a few minutes just kind of identifying the essential elements of a first episode psychosis, coordinated specialty care approach. And I'll walk you through sort of the basics of that. Um, it's in its infancy here in Washington, it's been around a little longer in other corners of the state and nationally, internationally, it's been in existence for a number of years. So we're only sort of in the infancy stage um, here in Washington, but anecdotally, we've got some uh, decent outcomes and I'll speak a little bit uh, about that with you. A second objective is gonna be to talk about what are the common difficulties that folks with lived experience um, when they're trying to be in the role of student what do they what do they experience? What are the kinds of uh, you know issues and barriers uh, that may be imposed uh, by their illness or uh, what we might describe as a psychiatric disability? So we'll try to identify those. Similar to what we do with um, IPS model around employment is we do a, a good, deep, and wide educational profile when we're talking with folks about returning to school and it's the same kinds of things we focus on with employment. Uh, we're looking at strengths, we're looking at preferences, we're looking at what their experiences have been in school, uh, what needs they may be able to identify. And that hopefully sharpens a particular goal. And then we, in our role as a specialist, then we're charged with going out and making that goal happen. So it's just like when you do the career profile that culminates in a specific um, job objective and then the specialist goes out and develops that job. So it's very much the same approach, same skill, uh, except we're talking about an educational setting instead of a vocational setting. The fourth objective starts to get into some of the wonderful material uh, that is increasingly out there on real specifics in terms of how do we support people uh, in the role of student, things that can be done by the student in the classroom, 
And then the fifth objective gets into specific um, accommodations that can be delivered because sometimes the strategies, you know, that we might share and try to develop in the student are inadequate. They don't get the job done. So in keeping with, you know, what we do from a psychiatric rehabilitation perspective, you know, there's the teaching of skills to try to improve or uh, make, make functioning, you know, work a little bit better in a particular setting. But when skills teaching alone doesn't get it done, then we have to provide supports. And in this instance, the supports would be accommodations that we might arrange through the Office of Disability Services or whatever it's called in a particular educational setting in your community. And then there's additional resources um, that we can tap that will help folks in their role uh, of student, both within and outside the academic institution. So that's our ambitious agenda uh, for, for this morning. So let's get into the details on uh, first episode psychosis teams. So here we go. Um, they're known by a couple of different names um, here in Washington. Um, first episode psychosis is sort of the generic term, both here in Washington and elsewhere in the US. Um, in Washington, we also refer to them as new journeys. And these were started up in 2017 and follow a particular model um, with some evidence space to it, obviously, uh, known as Navigate. So I'm giving you that um, for starters because you'll be able to get significantly more information if you were to just Google Navigate, it would take you right to the website uh, with considerable additional information there. Um, Navigate was originally developed with some significant support from the National Institute of Mental Health. And I've listed for you um, the principal authors in developing the model. Um, I'm hoping some of those names would be familiar uh, to you. Many of them um, work in the field of psychiatric rehabilitation. We also have a number of uh, doctors, doctoral level um, psychologists, and they're all affiliated with you know, the country's leading centers of excellence in mental health research and training. Um, so this is some technology uh, interventions and strategies that you know aren't just what we think will work. These are things that have been proven to work um, and do have an evidence base behind them. Uh, so that's good news. The mission of Navigate or New Journeys in our state is really to provide comprehensive interventions after a first episode of psychosis. And it's really intended to reduce the likelihood of subsequent episodes of psychosis and then enable and facilitate recovery. So for those of you that have you know, been in the field um, you know, for any length of time, you have probably wondered, as I have and many colleagues of mine have, you know, kind of like, what if? Like, what if after someone had that first break, we really surrounded them with all of the services, all of the interventions that might help restore their functioning, get them back on track? Could we reduce the likelihood of another episode, another psychotic episode, of a third psychotic episode? And, you know, the more that happens, the, the less people are able to come back. In other words, the functioning level is, is compromised a little bit more uh, with each and every psychotic episode. So it's kind of like if we could put those wraparound services, you know, in place after that first one, could we change the trajectory? Uh, a little bit more about that in a minute. So the essential elements are psychopharmacology, meaning that there's a, a prescriber that'll work closely with the um, client or consumer in really trying to come up with, you know, the right medicine to control the most symptoms with the fewest side effects um, as really the essential elements of um, trying to prescribe. And there's a number of other things that come into that as well in terms of, you know, making sure um, as much as possible that it's consensual uh, with the consumer, finding out from the consumer what, you know, his or her experiences may have been with medication while hospitalized or perhaps as an outpatient before they would be referred to a first episode psychosis team, any concerns they have around side effects, and trying to just sort of strike that, um, that balance. And so it's a very, we're going to meet you where you are kind of approach. And it's really good that the prescriber models that because that then is also the way the other members of the team work with the consumer. So after the um, 
uh, prescribers services, we also have a supported employment and education specialist. Uh, you all would obviously be familiar with what the roles and responsibilities would be for that individual. And then there's an individual that provides individual resiliency training, which is kind of a skills based um, coping skills, coping strategies, learning about your illness. It has a um, significant cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, approach embedded within it and really just you know helping to teach someone you know what is this thing called mental illness what is this thing we call recovery what are some things you can learn to you know manage your your illness above and beyond that which a therapist or a psychiatrist might be able to do and so there's an empowerment perspective to that there's a you know adding to knowledge uh, really getting people you know more fluent in the principles and practice of recovery, and that helps them to take some of their own responsibility uh, for managing illness and not allowing that to, excuse me, to you know interfere with what their their life goals may be. And then the last two um, elements of the Navigate approach are peer support, and that's hopefully pretty self-evident to you why that would be important. And in particular, if we're talking about youth with a um, a first episode they may not necessarily know a lot of people with lived experience they may feel that they're very alone and this is like the first time that's happened to anyone in their particular you know peer group uh, pre-onset so to meet someone that's kind of been there and done that um, can really give the person a lift and help them to take advantage of all of the services that the first episode of psychosis team is uh, is providing and then the last element is family education and what this does is really try to enlist the support of family, of friends, of other natural supports, and they learn more about mental illness. They learn more about treatment. They learn more about recovery. Um, they learn more about all the things when combined that can lead to people with a disability to still lead lives you know, that are um, successful and satisfying in the community and so they really become another member of the team in supporting their loved one uh, just as one example of how that actually happens um, day before yesterday i was at uh, the uw in the uh, hub which is like the student union building and we had about 200 people in the room that were learning a cognitive behavioral therapy for psychosis approach um, for their loved one so the room wasn't filled with the likes of us. The room was filled with family members. And they were learning in just plain speak ways that they could have their interactions with their loved ones informed, at least at times, uh, by a cognitive behavioral therapy or psychosis approach. And it helps families sort of get less unstuck, if I can phrase it that way, uh, in terms of, well, what do I say to my loved one when they're responding to auditory hallucinations? which is a really tough question. Um, so the CBTP approach, as we call it by its acronym, really gives them skills and strategies um, in terms of how to interact with their loved ones. So that is all for the good. Okay, so here are the five people that will populate a first episode psychosis team. We have the program director, and the program director obviously is sort of like the team lead or, or manager you know, for the service and for the other um, uh, providers that are on the team, they also work with families as the family education clinician. So their focus is to work with the natural supports of the consumer. Um, occasionally, obviously, that'll bring them in contact with the primary consumer because they may be working with the entire family, including the consumer, and reviewing some of the principles around family education and how everybody can just sort of work better together. Um, Second, we have the prescriber, and as I shared, that's a, a key role, obviously, to provide the pharmacological treatment, but again, in as horizontal and collaborative a way as possible. Um, supported employment and education specialist, obviously helping people you know, return to work or uh, school, and I would add be successful and, and satisfied, and maybe one other S word, sustained um, in that work or school setting. Uh, I mentioned the individual resiliency training, uh, you know, understanding their disorder and how to manage it, developing resiliency skills uh, for achieving their personal goals. That is a manualized um, intervention. It uh, doesn't have to be done in any particular order. Again, it's consumer driven in terms of 
where would you like to start? And here's, you know, 10 or, or 12 topics. And, oh, you'd like to start with unit number seven? Well, let's roll with that. And then the peer support specialist, as we see in a lot of other settings, you know, assist clients with understanding, you know, the notion, the practice, the principles of recovery, uh, working towards their personal goals, developing and using uh, coping skills. And very importantly, peer support specialists also influence team culture. And we've seen this both with um, SEP uh, teams, we've seen this with PAC teams that, although we don't often talk about it or write about it, the presence of the peer specialist helps the team, the non-peer members of the team, uh, to kind of just stay on their, on, their, on their toes, to stay on their game, uh, really be good ambassadors of recovery. Um, I think what the peer does is help influence the non-peer members of the team that regardless of what service they're providing, it should be embedded in the principles and notion of recovery. And that's a really good checks and balances that it avoids some of the verticality that uh, many consumers have just said, not interested in that. Uh, but if you'll get down here on the floor with me and, and we can work together on some things, uh, that I'm very interested in. So it just sort of helps to promote that recovery uh, culture. So it's an essential, essential element to the team. So a little bit sort of just context around first episode psychosis. Most of us know that serious mental illness will often have its onset in late adolescent or uh, early adulthood. And as we all know from our personal experience as well as professional experience, you know, that's a time of enormous development and growth um, for the young adult. And if you think about either completing school, moving on in school, uh, and or beginning, you know, more of a true um, working life, you know, those are major pieces of this growth and development. And too often, you know, the onset of a serious mental illness can significantly and adversely impact that growth and development. So what happens is instead of people hitting those developmental milestones of, you know, graduation from high school and moving on to, you know, some kind of additional um, schooling, whether that's, you know, college or some kind of vocational technical, that doesn't happen. Uh, and instead is replaced with admission to hospital, perhaps going on disability, uh, becoming increasingly isolated, um, and the outcomes obviously are, are not good with that. So you take that perspective and you merge it with what you see as the sort of third um, bullet on this slide. Many people endure psychotic symptoms for months, even years, uh, before receiving any treatment for their disorder. And there's so many things that get in the way of that. Um, I'm mentioning a few here in terms of, you know, stigma, uh, lack of awareness, lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, uh, confusion as to what may or may not be a developmental phase are among the reasons why. Um, any of you that have spent time, you know, talking with family members, you may have heard some combination of those factors, you know, being kind of responsible, you know, for what ultimately brought their loved one uh, into care but sometimes it's accompanied by a wish of, man, I wish I had noticed things sooner. You know, it wasn't just my kid as a teenager, you know, rebelling against authority. It was actually signs of psychosis. And had we gotten care going sooner, maybe the outcomes would have been better. So I think first episode psychosis wants to promote itself um, as we are the early intervention service. And if we can get that going sooner, we can change the course of the illness change the course of, um, of disability. So historically, um, first episode psychosis interventions had their origins in New Zealand and Australia. And it was interesting because it really began with major, and I could probably put that in bold print or capital letters, uh, public awareness campaigns that have really not been the priority, you know, in the US. I mean, it seems like the, the most we see in terms of advertising and public awareness campaigns are like advertisements for, you know, um, psychopharmacology, different prescription medications for anxiety, for depression. Um, occasionally we see them for uh, bipolar disorder. And I guess during, you know, mental health month or mental illness awareness week, uh, sometimes there'll be some, you know, public awareness things you might see as, a, you know, an editorial on the news, or perhaps it would be a freestanding um, advertisement. But there really hasn't been a lot of public awareness um, in the US, in New Zealand and Australia, that's what 
this whole sort of movement started with. They really got the word out that getting treatment to people sooner and earlier is a difference maker. So if you see any of the following signs or symptoms in a loved one, in a friend, in a colleague, um, you might recommend X, Y, Z. And so the referrals would take place. They were also, um, I believe, a little ahead of the curve in terms of mental health first aid. I hope that's a program that you've heard of and is available in your local community, uh, which basically trains lay people in how to recognize the signs of someone you know, experiencing a, an acute phase of mental illness and to begin intervention much in the same way we might do with first aid if someone were to be injured um, on the job. So, that, coupled with the fact that in those two countries, um, citizens have far more access to medical care than in the U.S., those two things together explain the lag, I think, in terms of getting FEP programs um, started in the United States. Okay, so a little bit more. Um, one of the things that really distinguishes first episode psychosis teams and this approach from sort of treatment as usual is the Navigate model offers clinical treatment of the illness and, emphasis added, considerable attention to restoring or enhancing consumer functioning in the many tasks and roles that are associated with being and doing in the community. So this really encompasses, includes, involves, you know, recovery elements such as quality of social relationships, you know, involvement in leisure and recreation activities that are you know, meaningful and important to the person, uh, good functioning and independent living skills and self-care, being satisfied and successful in school, in work, and or being a parent, cultivation of well-being or a sense of uh, self-esteem, hope, sense of purpose, and enjoyment of life. So this is why it's a team approach and the team is made up of people that have responsibility for the clinical treatment of the illness and, as we had on the top of the slide, making sure that attention is given to restoring or, or enhancing consumer functioning, you know, in the many tasks and roles. So these services and interventions then come together in a coordinated specialty care team and collaborate with the consumer, natural supports such as family, to make the above happen. So it's really about getting back on track. So again, that's a different way, I think, than we've seen in a lot of traditional mental health settings where someone you know, has an acute phase of the illness, they're hospitalized for a period of time, there's a discharge plan that involves you know, referral for some kind of outpatient care, perhaps they see a prescriber, um, if they're lucky, you know, they'll get connected up to a case manager or therapist type person, but not necessarily a lot of attention to getting back on track. It seems like the focus is too often solely on, um, you know, clinical treatment of the illness and not so much getting after some of those recovery elements as we see on this slide. So our existing teams at Valley Cities Behavioral Health Resources and Comprehensive Healthcare um, are giving us some anecdotal evidence that this is indeed working here in Washington, but I use the word anecdotal because we're not even at the two year marker. And so it's a little tough to say, oh yes, we have authenticated data about this and about that that clearly establishes. We're not able to use you know, language like that as yet. But what we hear from teams is that this is indeed helping to get folks back on track um, there's been reduced hospitalizations. There's been shorter hospitalizations when they do occur. Um, people have been successful in picking back up their educations and completing them, returning to work, uh, bettering their vocational you know, um, functioning in terms of perhaps moving on to other kinds of work that's more satisfying, that perhaps uh, pays better. And as a result of that anecdotal evidence, more teams are planned in Washington, uh, both for the rest of this year as well as next. So we might go from, currently we have four teams, um, one that just got started, which is why it's not listed here, uh, but we might be adding as many as four more and perhaps as many as eight more. So that could bring the maximum total up to um, 12, which would be really exciting because we would be getting it going in other parts of the state. That might be a little less urban than you know, a little more on the um, on the rural side, and it's certainly needed there every bit as much as it is 
um, here. So that's, I guess, the quick overview on first episode psychosis. I want to shift into uh, talking now about supported education, and we'll roll through these slides. And I'm keeping an eye on the chat box. If anything pops up, uh, we'll try to attend to it, and certainly we'll have some time at the end for any questions people may have. So some of this um, you may already know, but I think it's really important foundationally to talk about these social aspects of mental illness um, because it is, I think, the, the answer as to, well, why do we have supported employment and supported education, and for that matter, other kinds of supported services we may see, uh, whether it's housing or related things. I mean, one of the first things, you know, that we encounter is the widespread stigma that we still have in society. And that impacts on so many things, but it can really start with, it impacts getting help earlier. People don't want to be viewed as weak. They don't want to be viewed as, as um, you know, different. Um, and the, the fear, I think, particularly for young people is that they're going to be teased about that. They're going to be bullied about that. They're going to be shunned as a result of that. So that delays people. Um, getting care sooner. Now let's turn around a little bit, you know, with things like mental health parity and obviously the expansion of health care uh, through the Affordable Care Act that has promoted better access, easier access, uh, sooner access. But stigma is still a pretty formidable foe. And I know I'm talking to a number of employment specialists. No doubt you encounter that in some of your job development activities where you're out there and you're talking with an employer and immediately that stigma card you know, just comes out, well, aren't these people dangerous and, you know, related um, kinds of concerns and often come up. So that also then stigma gets in the way of, you know, really having that, that right mix of, of treatment and recovery resources and also remaining in care. Um, you know, too often our system may be experienced by consumers as kind of well, this is a take it or leave it, you know, kind of menu of services. And a lot of people will scan that menu and say, I, I think I'll leave it. You know, there's not a lot here for me. Uh, that could be changed if we had a deeper, wider, more varied um, menu of services and easier access to those services. So we have work to do um, there. The next item I think is also important to consider um, poverty, which is a result of vocational disability. You know, if folks are, um, on a monthly income of uh, 771, which I think is the approximate number for supplemental security income in our state, that equals an annual income nearly $3,000 less than the federal poverty level guidelines for one person. So I worked with a woman years ago when I was um, directing a clubhouse model program in North Carolina. She raised her hand at an employment support dinner one night and said, words that I will now quote, and I will pay homage to her by her name, Karen. Karen said, uh, poverty is really the first disability that most of us have. And you could have pushed me over with a feather. I mean, that was so true. And she was saying that as a way of sort of testifying as to why we were such a vocationally driven program, really dedicated to, you know, getting people back to work, increasing their monthly income, and then, you know, the resulting access that having more income would promote in terms of their community life. The next social aspect of mental illness that's important is folks are dependent on families and they're dependent on the public system of care. And that's fine, at least for starters. But what happens as we get to the next bullet, reduced access to care, families can grow weary. Um, our public system of care can be less responsive due to declining resources and also expanded numbers of people that are seeking services. So it's kind of like, you know, you're under-resourced and you're overpopulated. And that is a tough combination in terms of trying to provide comprehensive and also individualized um, care. So then we experience negative ripple effects as people with mental illness are diverted into homelessness, repeated visits to emergency departments, inpatient facilities, encounters with law enforcement, and just enormous costs are associated with that diversion. And it seems like, you know, every couple of months, we'll see a story about how much we're spending, you know, with like jails being the largest providers of mental health services in this country. And we all know that's not the appropriate setting for people with mental illness. So that's kind of my way of introducing that involvement in education and employment can positively impact all of the above. And so that really gets us to our topic around 
uh, supported education and why that's as important as our provision of supported employment um, services. So let's get into that a little bit deeper. So I think this is a good place to start because having a mental illness and the various symptoms associated with a mental illness can and do impact in significant ways someone's ability to fulfill the role of being a student or performing the various tasks associated with being a student. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. This would be the um, kind of the greatest hits, if you will, of um, some of the impact, some of the difficulties people experience in that role. Um, so we'll just run through these real quickly and we'll touch on them throughout um, our remaining hour. So just restlessness, um, you know, the inability to maybe just sit quietly and be present in the classroom and be able to um, pay attention. There can be a lot of um, physical symptoms in terms of feeling like you have to get up and, uh, you know, move about, or there can be side effects associated, you know, with, with tremors in your, you know, extremities, be it your arms or uh, legs. You can also be very easily distracted. Some of that can be driven by the particular symptoms that they experience. The symptoms themselves are distracting. There can also just be cognitive impairment around distracting. So you can be trying to concentrate on what a, a lecture might entail in a class or things that are being written on the dry erase board and suddenly find yourself, you know, your mind is just sort of wandering. And before you know it, you've completely lost track with the material uh, that is being put before you. Difficulty concentrating, we certainly see that not only in the role um, of student, we can see it elsewhere. That is directly related, uh, particularly to having a, um, a psychotic disorder. It's part of a cognitive impairment that accompanies a psychotic disorder. Um, there's also fatigue that can be secondary to poor sleeping habits and or side effects from medication. And we obviously see that with folks in and out of the um, role of student. And I know it can be a significant barrier in working with people on employment goals. Difficulty adapting to unexpected assignments is also on the list of things that are impacted. Sort of the ability to sort of flex and kind of go with things um, as they go. Sometimes the lack of sort of predictable structure can be a significant barrier um, for people. Uh, some of the folks that we serve indeed have um, symptoms related to panic, maybe not a full-fledged diagnosis of a panic disorder, but certainly have a tendency to accelerate rapidly um, when they're faced with some anxiety, and it takes on um, a very distinct sort of panic flavor. Other folks can report to you um, that their mind will just go blank, which is kind of related to the distractibility, can be related to difficulty concentrating or not. It can literally just be like the dry erase board in their brain was just erased and not necessarily any particular cause and effect that can be identified. Uh, memory problems can also be seen in terms of being able to remember things and then apply those things to perhaps new material that's coming down the road. That can be a significant barrier. And we also know increasingly today that a lot of our folks uh, may have had adverse childhood experiences or, or trauma. And as a result of ACEs or trauma, perhaps experience flashbacks, other kinds of intrusive memories, which can make it really difficult to be in the role of a student because often those are very unpleasant, very negative, um, maybe related to an actual feeling of, of terror. And that can make it really tough, again, to be in the role of um, a student. The good news is that we have a variety of strategies, uh, technology, interventions, supports, skills that can impact on all of these. And we'll be running through those quickly, and I will have a number of resources for you um, that Don will uh, send out after our time together today, um, as well as some online resources where you can you know, get uh, additional information. So there's some good news in response to all of this. Let's get into these a little bit more here. So first off, <clears throat> the IPS Center, which I'm hoping all of you are familiar with and you follow the evidence-based practice of supported employment um, as promoted by the IPS Center, they utilize a specific assessment for supporting consumers as students. And this will be among the handouts that I will share with you, referenced here as handout number one. And as with vocational services, it really is the table setter for everything that follows. And by that, 
I think if we really dig deep on assessment, really get to know the person we're working with um, in their aspiration, in their goal of wanting to be a student, what's gone right for them, what has not gone right for them, what are their preferences, what are the strengths that they bring uh, to the activities of, of being a student. The more we know about that, the better position we're in to support them in that goal and really help link them with what that specific opportunity is that makes the best sense for them. So it's just like we do with you know, the employment side in terms of really digging in, spending as much time as needed. Sometimes it's three sessions, you know, a couple of hours to really get through that career profile and have that culminate in that specific job development goal. And then what the specialist does is the specialist goes out and makes that job happen by talking with employers and hopefully getting the person you know, in front of employers for an interview and, and a hiring decision. So similar to what um, we do on the career profile, what the educational profile does is obviously it's focused more on the education and learning history. It'll look at any completed you know, programs, degrees, certificates, um, interests, you know, preferences. Uh, what were the experiences in school? Likes, dislikes, barriers to performance, any useful supports you know, that were a difference maker. Uh, what kinds of needs are they able to identify that they need now? And again, sets the table for a plan of success and satisfaction in their chosen academic uh, setting. And also, as we do with the employment uh, profile, having a thorough conversation about the risks and benefits of disclosure. And we do that just as is done in employment. And I hope uh, you know most of the folks on the on the webinar today, you know, are able to have that conversation where the list of the benefits far outweighs the risks. And I hope that makes people choose more often to disclose, because my own experience in supported employment and supported education is pretty clear. We can do so much more for someone with disclosure than without disclosure. And sometimes I've used those very words in working with consumers to help them uh, make a choice to disclose, because I can get them in front of employers sooner. I can support them on the job or in the classroom as needed with disclosure. Without disclosure, as you all know, then the supports we provide have to be more off-site, and sometimes those aren't as effective. So, and the other thing I would also mention about disclosure is it's never a one-time conversation. You know, someone can choose not to disclose, and then weeks, months later, if perhaps the progress on the goal is lagging, we can always revisit that, that we might be able to get things done quicker uh, with disclosure. So you can always circle back and have secondary conversations about disclosure. So there's a specific um, document that uh, the IPS uh, Center utilizes on disclosure in academic settings. And I will include that um, among the handouts, or obviously you can get it at the IPS Works uh, website. Okay, so this is again another parallel to how supported ed works that is identical to how supported employment works. The specialist has to spend time in the community getting to know the resources that are available to consumers in support of their academic goals. So just like time has to be spent you know, out there, uh, knocking on doors, talking with employers, going to the chamber, going to the JCs, going to Kiwanis, going anywhere where employers can be found, uh, in your role as a supported ed specialist, you got to get out and get to know the resources in the community that help people with their academic goals. So this would include local community colleges uh, and especially a disability services office, which almost every academic institution has now. And if not, it would be nice to ask about, well, how do you accommodate students with disabilities? Is there a person here that does that, if not an outright um, office? So local community colleges, four-year degree granting institutions, any vocational and technical training resources. Where is adult basic education? provided? What about local resources for general education development or what we call GED? And even fun ed providers. You know, some of the folks we work with may not want formal education, but boy, they would sure like to get into a photography class or an expressive watercolors class. And so we need to know about those resources in the community. So in the training and consulting work I do with specialists, you know, I always recommend that they visit those bins that you see, you know, outside the, uh, the supermarket or, you know, uh, other kinds of stores that list the kinds of courses that are just available in your community. 
And it can help you to get to know a few of those because if you're armed with that, when you're doing assessment with people, you can immediately start identifying resources in the course of doing the assessment. I think that really helps to develop and, and sustain a good working relationship with someone because you're not just collecting information, you're also sharing information. And in that sense, assessment is an intervention and not just, um, again, the gathering of information. So that network really allows you to begin matching consumer interest to specific resources in the community. So again, that's another advantage where if someone starts talking about, well, I had trouble with this, I had trouble with that when I was in high school, and you're able to say, well, you know, I was just talking to somebody at the Disability Services Office at, you know, X community college in terms of their support for people with, um, you know, disabilities uh, in pursuing a, a GED. And did you know they have a number of things that can be helpful on that? And suddenly the consumer's like, oh, and then you're like, yeah. So is that something you know I can do that we can do uh, to be to be helpful to you? So it can also be a really hope-inspiring intervention if you're armed with those kinds of resources uh, while conducting assessment. I think it's a proven difference maker. And I would also have to be a champion, as I am on the support and employment side, that time is needed to build and sustain that network in the community, just as you have to do with employment. And so this is sort of a hint, hint, wink, wink to specialists that you, you constantly have to advocate for having adequate time to be out in the community, interacting with people, meeting people, making second visits, third visits with people, uh, periodically just dropping by, hey, how's it going? I might have someone for you soon, blah, 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 blah. Don't allow yourself to be diverted into other kinds of work that take you out of your specialist role. Um, as you know, the high fidelity standard for the work uh, that you're charged to do. Okay, so supporting the consumer as student, as the disclosure discussion can be as important here as with employment. Uh, and as I said earlier, it affects the services provided, especially where they are provided. And I hope your experience has been consistent with mine, um, that you can do so much more and it can really be a difference maker if you're able to support someone on the job or in school, as opposed to meeting with them after or during a break or across the street, you know, at McDonald's, you're limited in the kinds of supports that you can provide. Um, so it's good to provide full disclosure around that, but you can do more, um, obviously, with disclosure than you can without. And just as we do with employment, going out and about with the consumer to the specific setting where the academic program will be pursued is recommended, that can be such a, uh, a great vehicle for obtaining additional information, because obviously you're going to be talking while you're walking. Um, but also the consumer can really start to get a picture of what's this place like and could I see myself fitting in here and oh well if I can't see myself fitting in here why and then do you as the specialist have supports and skills that could be difference makers there so walking around getting a sense of things you know visiting the disability services office how about the bookstore what about the student union building well where do you get a cup of coffee Wander around, check all that out, you know, talk about what you're seeing and, and what you're hearing and asking and answering questions like, is this a place you can see yourself fitting into? Why or why not uh, can be also very, very helpful. And this middle bullet about building confidence and hope, um, I get accused sometimes of trying to turn um, some of my, you know, consulting and training clients into cheerleaders. And I'll plead guilty to that. I think. Um, the repetition of messages like we know how to help isn't just talk. Um, we walk that talk by sharing the various ways the specialist and team, if you're, if, you're, if you're part of the team that has other services embedded in it, can support the consumer as student. So it's a way of responding positively to some of the negative self-imposed um, messages that the consumer may be experiencing um, that we're just answering that in a uniform way, in a consistent and repetitive, creative way. Oh, we can help you with that. Oh, we, we know how to help with that. 
And that helps people begin to think about, hey, you know, maybe this thing really could be possible. So having some dialogue about the specific challenges that the person may be having in and outside the classroom can certainly follow. Um, that can either be a part of the educational profile you're developing or secondary to it. Maybe you're getting additional information that suggests you should revisit um, some of the questions that were asked about challenges in and outside uh, the classroom. As you learn those things, some of that will be very appropriate to you know, share and coordinate with other providers, especially any of the mental health professionals that are working with um, the client, because there's some clinical attention that can be brought to bear on that. I mentioned earlier the cognitive behavioral therapy for psychosis. Um, that's essentially skills teaching around how to challenge some of the like automatic thoughts you may be having that you can, for example, examine the evidence of those thoughts that you're having. So if you're having negative thoughts of, oh, I can never succeed here, right? What a trained therapist can do from a cognitive behavioral therapy perspective is begin to gently challenge that notion, examine the evidence. Well, what are the things that tell you that you couldn't fit yourself in? And is there anything we could put on the other side of the ledger that would suggest you'd be able to fit yourself in? And you gently begin challenging that self-imposed negative notion of I can't to hopefully replace it with I could. And so again, that kind of coordination, um, obviously with FEP teams, we have that, with sort of community treatment teams, we have that. But for a lot of supported employment you know, providers that are you know, part of um, outpatient mental health services, most of you are embedded within a treatment team and therefore there are prescribers, there are mental health professionals that are also working with your consumer. And so I'm just encouraging that you have a dialogue uh, with them about your findings and ask questions of them in terms of ways they can support the person uh, in their vocational slash educational uh, goals. And similar to benefits counseling, this is also important. Um, you as a specialist must get familiar with the financial aid services that are available help the consumer to understand and utilize these safely. And that's suggested in particular because there are a lot of um, providers, I'm gonna use that term loosely out there, of financial aid um, that really do seek to victimize um, people, particularly people that are poor, people that um, may not have a lot of um, financial literacy and so we need to sort of be in that protective or advocate role, at least for some of the people uh, that we serve, in terms of really vetting for-profit academic programs, some online academic programs. Um, we should view them automatically, I think, through the lens of being a little suspicious and therefore thoroughly vet them. And then we kind of come up with a disposition that seems like a, a good way to go, or perhaps it isn't, and we should continue um, looking the track records of some for-profit and online providers are not good. And so what we don't want to do is get somebody saddled with all kinds of financial aid and student loans um, for a program that they don't complete, because then that becomes an additional barrier um, to their economic um, success in the community. So some caution around that is suggested. Okay, let's get into some of the details about what do we do and how do we attend to some of the problems that folks have. And these are four sort of um, larger or generic issues or areas where people have difficulty. And I'm just gonna give you a couple of tips on ways we can support people that have difficulties with planning, attention, memory, and reasoning skills. And then we'll finish by um, scrolling through um, a wonderful, um, I just borrowed it a little bit from the Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation at Boston University on specific things that a student can do when they're experiencing issues with these or other uh, barriers, and then also accommodations that can make a difference. So between the two, we can really help people succeed even if or even when they experience difficulties with planning, attention, memory, or reasoning skills. And these four areas, I think, are also highlighted here because this is, those are not just issues or problems in learning, in the role of being a student. We also see these things getting in the way of the other disability domains, you know, of living, of working, and socializing. So any attention we give to people to help them with their planning ability, 
their ability to, you know, be present in the learning moment in terms of attention, enhancing their memory, enhancing their reasoning skills is going to help them succeed in the other domains of living, working, and socializing. So they clearly have utility, you know, beyond just um, what we might do with someone in supported education. So let's look at each of these four real quick. Here we go. So deficits in planning, um, barriers. You know, folks may have difficulty with large multi-step assignments. There can be trouble with due dates. Uh, there can be difficulties with just showing up late for class, uh, returning late from break, managing work commitments in class due to not really attending to, you know, planning for task completion. And then that barrier that many of us uh, have faced, do face, uh, procrastination. So those things together or alone can be real barriers to people putting in place a plan and then being able to execute the plan uh, to get to the completion of a particular assignment. So here's some strategies. Direct instruction by practitioners such as you or others that might work with the consumer in a professional capacity. And I would add this can include um, peer counselors. I think they're in a great, great position to be able to help with this. Basic things around planning. You know, as you see on the slide here, you know, things like just time management and working on things incrementally. Uh, these may be things that some of us take for granted because we've sort of acquired them and practiced them, you know, as we sort of moved on in our adult lives. But what if you never learned those? Well, someone would need to teach them to you. So I'm suggesting that we can be instrumental in um, instead teaching. Helping folks to visualize the use of new skills and completing of task assignments. In the psych rehab literature, they refer to this as pre-actional planning. And what it basically entails um, is really thinking about when, where, how, and how long to act. So we're really breaking things down into much smaller increments. So again, as you see with the examples here, you know, starting on time, you know, at the beginning of the day and after breaks, conveys that those aren't required those are requirements and not suggestions so for example if a class starts at 10 o'clock you need to be there early 10 o'clock is not a suggested time that you're to show up and if there's a 15 minute break at the midpoint of a class what can you do to make sure that you're back on time and so yeah i mean that general reminder might work with some we also know that phones have lots of interesting features including a timer so when the break begins you could set your timer for 15 minutes you could go for a walk you could get a drink of water and then beep 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 beep, beep time to go back to class that helps build the skill set for being able to manage oneself in an educational setting and it's directly related um, to planning and then you know here's some other things kind of in a potpourri you know ensuring that instructions are delivered in concrete terms the use of checklists, the use of a planner uh, or a calendar, you know, the sequence of events to bring a project to the finish line. So just think for a moment about, you know, at any point in your academic careers, when you were assigned like a big paper, well, what were some of the first steps that would go through your mind or perhaps be committed to paper, you know, um, around that? Well, it might include things like what's the due date? And I need to be sure to get that on my calendar. And then maybe start thinking about an outline. So when would I hope to have various parts of my outline completed? And so you develop that outline. You put some timelines to it. And then you're thinking, OK, so in two weeks, I need to have the introduction written. And in four weeks, I need to have the body of the paper written and in six weeks I need to make sure that I've really hit the nail on the head in terms of the conclusion and if I'm having to list sources or any kind of a bibliography you know that I've done that and it's really ready to be proofread oh and by the way that's a full week before the due date so again we might have learned that and for some of us we may have learned it the hard way you know when we were in uh, in school and college etc but again if you've never learned that we have a responsibility to help teach that so that helps to address deficits in planning. Let's go to the next one, attention. Barriers, people may experience what's known as poor attentional control. And that has to do with 
where do you get my focus? Folks can start staring off into space. They can be repeating questions. You know, there can be unfinished tasks, various kinds of distractions. So we need to have some clear strategies. And this is um, one that also includes accommodations. Clear, defined segments in instructional sessions. That's an example of an accommodation that could be requested of an instructor. And the instructor would then deliberately say, OK, people, we're shifting now to what we were just talking about. And we're about to move on to the second part of today's lecture, which is on the subject of blank. So just clearly announcing that we're moving from part A and we're now transitioning into part B. Something as simple as that can really help someone whose attention has a tendency to wander to not wander. So this might be something, for example, that a specialist could suggest to the Office of Disability Services. It would be included in a letter that would be delivered to the instructor. And the instructor would then say, sure, I can do that. Because again, the accommodations have to be reasonable. And so Disability Services is not going to ask an instructor to do anything that is unreasonable. And I can tell you from my own teaching experience, I taught at the School of Social Work at UW for a couple of quarters. And in both of the quarters, I had students that brought to me a letter needing accommodation. And it was very clear and explicit what they were asking me to do. And so I delivered. And in doing so, I really enabled those people to take full advantage of the class. And both of them did extraordinarily well. So it, it makes sense, I think, for that, that perspective. So clear defined segments, announcements that the topic is shifting. Um, folks can also benefit from specific breaks for rest, uh, for practice, or learning activities. One example of that would be if you're teaching like a, you know, a two-hour class, uh, sometimes a three-hour class, you know, it would be very normal to say that there's going to be a break at the midpoint of 15 minutes. Well, some of our folks, their attention is simply not going to last 90 minutes until the break. So they might request, I need a break every hour for five minutes. In which case, again, that's a very reasonable accommodation that we can make. And when we do, it's a difference maker for the student. Another accommodation that the instructor can do is make references to tying new material to that which was previously learned. So an example of that for, um, for mental health would be if I were to move from a lecture on how to do assessment to how to then develop a treatment plan, I wouldn't just launch into discussion of treatment plan. I would make references to that which we had just covered on assessment. And so we would use elements of the assessment to then drive the delivery of the treatment plan. That will help someone's attention see the connections, see the intersections between those two things, help them to remember that which we talked about in assessment. And therefore, they're in a much better position to really tune in and benefit from the new material on treatment planning uh, that we're currently discussing. The same supported employment principles of encouragement, of repetition, of helping people to practice, um, use of what we call task analysis, which is where you take a, you know, a, a, a big task and you break it down into all of the sequential steps that will lead to its successful conclusion. A lot of positive self-talk, prompts to stay on task, any kind of handouts, cue cards, all of those things can help here. Specialists and others, family supports, mental health professionals, peer counselors can all be involved um, in those kinds of SE principles. And something as basic as coaching and support to review material prior to a lecture. So encouragement, did you read the notes from last lecture? Well, maybe you should, because my guess is the instructor is probably going to reference some of that in presenting new material in the lecture tomorrow. So that could just be a little prompt that in your role of specialist, um, you would provide to someone that could help them with their attention. So here we go, memory. The ability to hold and process information. What the literature is clear, and it's not just specific to people with psychiatric disabilities, is that poor recall is more connected to, more related to deficits in the ability to remain present in the learning moment. Present in the learning moment. So in some ways, it is directly related to attention. So the things we're talking about in attention 
are also going to help with memory. But it takes on added urgency because memory is essential to long-term deep learning that is needed to use knowledge on the job. And attending to it is critical to academic success and satisfaction. So here are some of the things that can make it difficult for memory. Moving from class to class, moving from instructor to instructor, may not build on previously learned content, may not help integrate key concepts, may not apply knowledge and skill to newer scenarios, different scenarios in a way that promotes long-term retention. So here are the strategies, and there's a little bit of redundancy here from the previous slide. Connecting previously learned content with new concepts is essential. So either the instructor could do that, or part of our coaching of someone, our support of someone in an educational setting might be to just sit down and review with them well, what'd you learn in last week's class? Let's just go over that real quickly. Um, and then in that discussion, you might then say to the person, hand me your notes and then tell me from memory, what do you remember from last week's lecture without looking at the notes? And then maybe you can help fill in the cracks because you got access to the notes and you know you may not have actually been in the class. That leads into practicing retrieval exercises that helps learners generate responses repeatedly and with minimal prompting until recall becomes fluent and reflexive. So really what you're teaching there with the example that I just shared is they can learn to do that themselves. In other words, they can learn to review the notes before they go to the next lecture. They can learn to put those notes down and say, okay, the five top themes, the five you know, most salient elements of what was covered in that lecture is as follows. One, two, three, four, five. That's helping to embed it in their memory. Um, the other piece that can help with this is practice applying what was taught, doing so repeatedly, lots of open-ended questions, lots of reflective listening. So again, that's, that would be part of a retrieval exercise. Well, so what do you think about that? What do you think was meant by that? Well, why was that highlighted and, and you know, discussed as being important in terms of that lecture? You're really helping to kind of fill in the cracks. That purposeful practicing of retrieval helps the person to catch it and hold it in their memory. So I certainly encourage some, some work there uh, where and when appropriate. Now we get to reasoning. Thinking through and analyzing information in a logical way influences daily decision making. And without it, academic and vocational performance can suffer. So the difficulties are, you know, in sort of, in a, in a sort of rapid fire way, can someone identify the pros and cons? Can they brainstorm multiple solutions? And this is a major barrier because some of this is kind of abstract. And one of the things we know particularly about psychotic disorders is it can be really difficult to think and react to things that are abstract. So that leads to indecision and that can lead to a dead end. So we clearly have to attend to this. So once again, direct instruction in problem solving, in critical thinking, in analysis uh, and, and logic. Um, I can think of many times where I would work with a consumer directly and just the old thing about take an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, draw a vertical line down the middle of it. One column is for the pros on something, the other column is the cons. So what are the reasons why you would do something? What are the reasons why you wouldn't do something? And you make that as exhaustive a list as you can, and then you make an informed decision based on that. Now that seems really concrete, and it is, but it is also helping to teach that there's a way in the moment you can do that very same thing. And so if you're called upon in a class or in a paper to get into some reasoning on something, in, order, in other words, to be able to put forth um, a thought and support it, that you're teaching the skills and how to do that. This is another area that can benefit from small groups and there are some uh, mental health agencies that, that do this either as part of supported employment and supported education, or perhaps as part of just peer led kinds of initiatives. Uh, you can certainly inquire of your own office agency or other consumer and 
and uh, peer organizations in your area, small groups that help in teaching and reinforcing problem-based learning. You know, looking at life problems and the group working on them together, often it will include things like, well, what would be the, you know, the advantages of moving in that direction? What would be the disadvantages? What would be the reasons for? What would be the reasons against? Um, and it increases the achievement of educational objectives and it boosts the motivational and emotional, you know, aspects that can be so important um, to learning. A couple of other things just very concretely that help here. Recording of lectures, creating study guides, content summaries, outlining, those things can help reinforce or by themselves help create better abilities in terms of um, reasoning. And obviously individual support uh, can help with that as well. So again, this is just a quick down and dirty on those, those four areas, but when we attend to the limitations around planning, attention, memory, and reasoning. The impact is positive and it greatly enhances the likelihood that learners will be successful and satisfied. But again, I recognize that in you know 20 minutes, none of us are gonna become experts in that, but these are things to look for, strategies that I'm sharing, you could begin to try, you'll begin to see that you can get some traction on them and hopefully that will encourage you to, to do it even more and with more people and also to get additional support in uh, these areas. And again, some of the resources I have at the end, I believe will help you with that. Okay, so now we're gonna shift one of the handouts that I'll have for you and is also referenced in the resources at the uh, end of the slides today is a wonderful manual that was developed by the Center uh, for Psychiatric Rehabilitation at Boston University. And just take a look at these columns. I mean, I looked at this and said, boy, I wish they had this available to me you know, 20 years ago. Uh, would have been a difference maker. So I am a big time cheerleader around utilizing this because look at column number one on the left, it lists the difficulty that the student might be experiencing. And then the middle column, strategies for the student. In other words, the things that we can do in job coaching, the thing that other practitioners can do um, that will help the student in the moment be able to, you know, uh, proceed and pursue uh, being successful and satisfied as a student. And if those alone are not enough, the column on the right-hand side of the slide talks about accommodations that could be requested and provided by the academic institution. We don't spend a lot of time on these because, I mean, you'll, you'll have the slides. And again, when you get the, uh, the, the handout number three, it'll speak to that specifically. Let's just roll through a couple of them just to get a, get a sense. So, Let's look at fatigue while we're on this particular slide. Strategies for the student would be to attend class at the preferred time of day. So this would be something that hopefully would have been covered during the educational profile. You a morning person? You an afternoon person? When you go to bed? When you take those bedtime meds? Are you able to get up and make it to a nine o'clock class? Oh, you're not? Well, maybe we need to look at afternoon classes when you're a little more alert, that kind of thing rest time between classes, between courses, that would assume someone's taking more than one. So you might wanna look at what the spacing of those classes may be. Um, and we also know there's very positive effects in terms of people being more alert, more awake, um, if there's some exercise before class. It doesn't even necessarily have to be something formal. They can walk around campus, arrive early enough. You know, if the place where you get coffee is on the op opposite side of campus from the building in which you'll be attending class, go get coffee then walk back and then you'll be a little more alert, a little more awake. So again, just some basic things. The accommodations that could be provided in the face of fatigue, a reduced course load. So part of our work with folks is to not have them bite off more than they can chew. Although sometimes biting off more than you can chew can be a very um, valid and important learning experience. So we gotta kind of walk the fine line there, but sometimes starting smaller and experiencing some success with that smaller increment might suggest then that you're able to tolerate the demands of a greater case course load. So that's just one example. We'll look at one or two others and um, then I wanna make sure we've got time for any questions or comments people have. So we covered you know, poor concentration, uh, arranging to photocopy someone's notes, organizing time for homework in shorter sittings, even if it's more frequent. So that might suggest that someone is at their best for maybe 15 minutes, and then after 15 minutes, the con concentration starts to wane. 
then what we do is we work with them on defining some 15 minute increments that they're gonna do homework. So when will those take place? Let's put them in your planner. Let's put them in your calendar. Um, and then checking back with the person, how's that going? Are you, you know, attending to those scheduled times for homework as we discussed, as we agreed, circling back to find out about that. Uh, writing things down, keeping a list, keeping a journal, can also help to address poor concentration. You know, the kinds of accommodations we see here are, you know, pretty, pretty basic. Um, tape recording the class, an accommodation can also be to request a note taker pre-arranged breaks. I used the uh, example earlier of a 15 minute break, you know, at the, at the midpoint of a three hour class may not work, but five minutes every hour would work. Taking tests in a separate room to reduce distractions. That was one of the accommodations requested uh, by a student in my class and it was easy to provide. I just had to identify alternative space, escorted the student to that space, gave them the same papers that the students in the class were doing, and they circled back to us upon completion of the exam. Done. No problem whatsoever. Let's look at a couple more. Uh, here's just a simple one. Dry mouth from medication. That's a common side effect with some of the um, medications people are prescribed, so we encourage them to bring a beverage to class. Most classrooms in most settings are okay with that. Some might not be. If they were not, then that would be an accommodation. That would be very reasonable to request from disability services that the person is on medication that causes extremely dry mouth. We would request an accommodation of being able to bring a beverage to collect. Okay, that would be an easy one to ask for. Uh, let's see, hospitalization. This is one we're spending a minute on. If hospitalized, you know, during the semester or the quarter, you got to contact the instructor. You have to make a request to complete homework from hospital or arrange for an incomplete grade rather than fail a course. I can't tell you the numbers of people I met in my direct services career that just dropped out and then, you know, had an F. And you get a couple of Fs, it can be really hard to bring up your GPA. It can really make it hard if you're trying to move from a two year to a four year, you know, because you've got blemishes on the academic record. So if someone has to pull out, help them pull out the right way. Uh, let's see here, da, 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 da. let's talk about panic for just a minute and then we'll, we'll head for the finish line and have opportunities for any questions or comments people have. So experiencing panic attacks. Strategies for the student begin with going early to class, making sure that you choose the absolute best seat where you're going to be most comfortable um, often that's near the door so that if you're feeling uncomfortable, you would have an easy exit strategy. Using cold water on face and hands is an absolute sort of core intervention for folks in the throes of a panic attack. The coldness of the water helps to provide them with a little bit of a jolt, and that has a tendency to de-escalate um, some of the panic symptoms. Before class or missing class, it's kind of similar to what we said around hospitalization, notify the instructor. That's part of the culture of attending any kind of academic setting. If you're gonna be absent, you gotta notify the instructor. So don't just let go. Um, you know, if it's repeated, make sure you arrange for an incomplete rather than failing the course. So again, some of this has to do with really teaching students the culture of college, the culture of the school. Uh, and culture includes, well, what are the expectations of this culture? And if people have never been there before, or it's been a while, uh, they may need a refresher course on what is the culture of going to a two-year or four-year uh, college. Anxiety, pretty basic. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do in terms of relaxation techniques, grounding techniques. This is just a short course on things that you know we can do with student deep breathing, touching something, noting the temperature or the texture of what we're touching, you know, whether it's the table, the chair, the book bag, really focusing on that object that's known as grounding techniques. Your mental health professionals would be great in terms of expanding on that, but even as a non-mental health professional, non-clinician, there's a lot of information on the internet out there about grounding and relaxation techniques. 
um, you could certainly access that and absolutely share it with the person you're working with. I would suggest you also share it with the clinician that's working with the person just so that everybody's on the same page. So you got a couple more in here, uh, pressured by voices or other stimuli, being self-conscious, being paranoid. I mean, you can really see they've covered so many of the difficulties with both strategies for the student as well as accommodations that the school could provide. Um, it's a great list. And again, this is all part of the, uh, the handout that will be sent to you uh, probably shortly after today. I'll get all this shipped over to Don and Don will distribute it uh, to all and each of you. So a couple more things. Um, relaxation techniques I mentioned include things like meditation and deep breathing, mindfulness. You know, there's a lot of attention to that right now. Reaching out to one's support system, tuning into one's body and so forth. I've got a handout for you on some basic uh, relaxation techniques. Uh, clinicians often use a monitoring log. Um, I know peers also use this in terms of thinking about a wellness recovery action plan. Some develop wellness recovery action plans for work. And so a monitoring log could really be helpful and something both the peer um, and an employment specialist could work on. Positive self-talk, something we can work side by side with people on to help them become acquainted with the principles of that. It's very much embedded in cognitive behavioral therapy. Again, something to coordinate with the mental health professional. Uh, grounding techniques uh, we talked about just a moment ago. So I'll have some additional information for you about that and plenty more if you just Google relaxation techniques, grounding techniques, positive self-talk, a lot of help on that. So here are a few resources, and then we'll be able to open it up for um, some questions between now and 10 o'clock. Obviously, you're all familiar with the IPS Center. There's their um, website. These are a little dated from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, but I still recommend that people, you know, get them, um, you know, download them and have them available. For a long time, SAMHSA only had a manual on the evidence-based practice of support and employment, which was a little scant on information about supported ed in the last X years. They've come up with a separate uh, manual now on supported education as an evidence-based practice. Um, some of what I've shared with you today is uh, directly from that, so that's a great resource. A go-to place for just an intro to financial aid to avoid some of the mishaps that can uh, happen in trying to navigate that. Um, is the federal government's uh, website on financial aid. Um, it's a go-to resource for its basics. And once you have the basics, you kind of know like, well, where else to go and what else to ask about, um, what else you need to know about in order to help protect people from some of the vultures uh, that are out there in the financial aid community. And then the Boston University Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation, wonderful resource. Uh, you go to their gateway page, they have a link uh, to resources and all kinds of things related to employment, related to education, related to recovery in general are available. Uh, many of those resources are free and available for download. They have a bookstore and a, a few things that you can uh, spend money on. But the few that I've listed after their gateway page, they have a uh, wonderful curricula on a family employment guide, which is great for when you're working with natural supports. How can you help them to also become cheerleaders that their loved one would benefit economically, medically, socially from going to work? Or as you see from the last resource, the higher education toolkit does the same thing in terms of really helping to encourage parents, natural supports to really promote that you gotta get going on an employment or education goal. You know, it's not just working or going to school. There's medical benefits in terms of fewer hospitalizations, shorter hospitalizations when they do occur, reduced frequency, reduced intensity of symptoms. So boy, medically, there's all kinds of good reasons for going to work or going to school. And then, you know, the social aspects of going to work, going to school, you meet people. And when you meet people, you got opportunities for recreation and social activities um, with them. You've got opportunities for romance, intimacy, and sex. And those are universal human needs that we all have. Access to work, access to school um, brings us closer uh, to those kinds of opportunities. So recommended for all of those reasons. So we've got 10 minutes to go and I am gonna open up the chat box a little bit more. Anything you're wondering about that I could expand on a bit more, um, happy to hear from you via, via chat. So don't be shy.
Jonathan, this is Wanda Johns with the Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery, and I have a question about disclosure for employment um, versus uh, disclosure for education. I think you made a great point that uh, the sooner that you disclose, the better, because then you can get your accommodations. But is that necessarily true with employment? Oh, I, I think it is. Um, you know, disclosure enables the specialist to do more, and I'll, I'll give you some examples of more. If someone declines disclosure and I'm working with them on an employment goal, basically all I can do as a specialist is identify leads, and the person then has to follow up on that lead by themselves. So they're going to either walk into the employer or, or be forced to apply for a job online. A lot of our people don't present really well online. And so it may delay achievement of the vocational goal because perhaps they don't present themselves very well in person either. So if they choose to disclose and I'm able to walk into the employment setting with them and introduce them to an employer that I've already developed a relationship with, chances are far better that the employer would say, oh, this is one of Jonathan's people. Sure, I'll sit down and talk with you for a few minutes. It also can reduce some of the high anxiety the consumer may experience because I'm tagging along. Uh, you could call it a little bit of hand-holding in a kind of figurative um, way. And also that I've greased the path in terms of this is an employer that knows who I am, that knows where I work, that knows you may have some holes, you know, in your employment history, and that doesn't matter. So it just may help the person to present better and hopefully get an affirmative uh, hiring decision. In school, it's almost the same because if the person chooses to disclose, I can link them with the disability services office. I can make sure in my role as advocate that the accommodations that would make a difference are indeed communicated to the disability services office and hopefully you know, approved and provided. Uh, you know, by that academic institution. I would add that that part of the um, disclosure could also include maybe initially, I need to go to class with the person. I've done that in my career. And just sat in the back and the consumer I'm with knew I was in the back, didn't identify me. I was just someone sitting in the room. Instructor didn't identify me. I'm just somebody sitting in the room. You know, for all they knew, I could have been like the dean or a dean's representative and maybe I'm evaluating the instruction, you know, being provided uh, by the instructor. So there was no, you know, violation of, you know, confidentiality or anything. So those are just a few examples of where the specialist can do more with disclosure. A lot of it really has to do with getting people into the role sooner as opposed to later. So I'm a big proponent of saying yes to disclosure, but obviously I respect the decision if someone chooses to say no. I will still work with them to the extent possible, and I will revisit disclosure if weeks and months go by without progress on the educational or vocational goal. Thank you. Uh, Paul Stayback has a question. I think I can unmute him. I'm going to try that real quick. Oh, okay. If you want to handle the muting and unmuting, that's fine. Let's do it. Um, sure. Let's do it via audio. Paul, can you uh, speak? Yes. Can you guys hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, Paul. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. So how would you balance the need in an educational environment, uh, say, you know, the college environment, with the need for support in the classroom to help the student get through and overcome their barriers versus maybe uh, supporting taking a break so that they can, you know, get the treatment and come down out of, out of that break? Because, I mean, I'm out of Seattle and I've seen plenty of people who have a break and then end up on the streets because they kind of wander out of school and they get lost in, in the masses. So how do you balance need for support and remaining in the classroom versus maybe going home and being in a supportive environment with family? No, that's a tough call, Paul, because I think, um, you know, we obviously have to say it would really depend on the individual and that's not trying to dodge your question. Um, I think one of the things that I try to communicate to specialists is to really talk about outcomes, that the outcomes are better if people go to school. The outcomes are better 
if people go to work. I try to link that to other goals the person may have. Like if someone says, I never wanna go back to the hospital, we can tell them that part of the answer to that, part of the solution to that, part of the response to that is supported employment and supported education. Because the research says people are less likely to go to hospital, or if they do, they'll go for a short period of time if they're working or if they're in school. So I'm big on that. You can call it informed consent or just providing good information so that people can make good choices. If someone is truly struggling in class, and by that I mean if that's something new as opposed to something that is fairly constant, then I think that requires some consultation both with the, the, the person in the role of student, but also the, the clinical treatment team. Like, what's the best decision? Should we try to continue to support the person in the role of student? Or would it make sense to recommend that there's a withdrawal and an incomplete, and then we attend to whatever that acute situation may be and get the person back in class the following quarter? So that's, that's probably what my thinking would be on it, at least initially. Great. Uh, we also have a question from Pam Patterson. I'm going to try to unmute Pam now. Thank you, Wanda. Go ahead, Pam. Oh, she says she can't unmute. Uh, Pam, try to try to speak. It says you're on your computer speaker or microphone. Pam, are you there? Her name keeps popping up. Yeah, um, I'll just remute her and read the question. It says a lot of great opportunities to provide. Seems that more time could be involved. I feel that 30 hours of billable time is not enough. Can you talk about a bit about what is billable hours? I yeah, that's she's a tough... talking about the FCS benefits. It would be hard for me to know that. Um, so it's important to sort of know what you know and know what you don't know. One thing I can say in response to this is that I think for a lot of us, when we think about the number of people we're working with, sometimes the rule of thirds applies. And by that, I mean, we might be working with one third of the people, you know, that we're assigned to work with, and we're in kind of like the early stages. So maybe we're doing engagement and rapport building and perhaps getting the, you know, career or educational profile underway. And yes, there's some time that would obviously be associated to that third. And then you got your middle third, which are people that have moved through that sort of first third and are really in the, I'm in job development, I'm in you know educational development, we're looking for the right combination, the right mix of factors that'll help to make that happen. And then you've got your other third, which is where you know folks have achieved the role of student, achieved the role of worker, and are just getting sort of ongoing support for that. So there's different time intervals that are associated with this rule of thirds and it'll flex a little bit but i tend to think that the bulk of one's hours are going to be devoted to that middle third with a little bit less time dedicated to that first third and to that third third so in a, in a general way that's the way i would want to respond i mean in terms of like what's billable and all of that, I, I'm not in a position to speak to that. That would be something better directed to, you know, your your program manager or perhaps to, you know, representatives at, at uh, DBHR. I mean, Melody comes to mind, Lisa comes to mind, uh, would be able to answer that, perhaps Wanda or, or Dawn, um, other resources within there. Anything else as we start to approach the 10 o'clock hour, anything else I can help with? I have a lot of thank you showing up. Um, so thank you, Jonathan. We really appreciate your presentation. The Don Miller will be sending out uh, slides and any additional resources Jonathan provides after the um, webinar. 
everybody have a great day and thank you again. A pleasure being with you and I hope uh, hope you got something of, uh, of value. You have my contact information on the last slide. Don't hesitate to reach out if there's something I can do to be helpful. Bye everybody. Take care, thanks. Okay.